Good night, everyone. And welcome to the Independence Lecture by the Democratic Labour Party. I'd like to welcome those here with us at Joy Street. And I'd also like to send a special welcome to those watching online um, with us. We have a very special, special, special guest for you this uh, evening, this night. Um, and it is historian, social activist, Trevor Marshall, taught at Barbados Community College at UE. And I say special because I think Trevor has taught every single Barbadian history in one way or the other. Now, Trevor, Tre <laughs> Trevor, <laughs> Trevor, Trevor is of the view that he taught me history at community college. And I never did history, but I think we all used to spend so much time in the history room. And anyone who went to community college will tell you that somehow they felt that they were in that history class, even though we never officially were doing history. So pervasive, so energetic, so intellectual. It just pervaded the entire college. Uh, the community college uh, was a very, very, very special place then. It's still a special place now, but there was something extraordinary about Trevor and his presence to us all in terms of shaping and molding a generation of Barbadian and, dare I say, Caribbean leadership. We have so much to be grateful for this man for. He's given of service to country. He's given of his time. And, and this, 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 this evening... Uh, we will have a lecture from him on Barrow, the social engineer and revolutionary. I look forward to what will be an interesting uh, dynamic uh, and in the only way that Trevor will be able to do uh, thought provoking and probably slightly, in fact, I shouldn't say slightly, controversial. Let, let, let's go. <laughs> I'd like to introduce my friend, uh, my old teacher, uh, the raconteur, that is Trevor Marshall. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, Mr. President. Uh, I don't know if I've told you before, but if I haven't, belated congratulations on your elevation to position of president of this extremely important party. Um, yes, I labored under the illusion that you did do history, you and your brother, but I mean, Oh my God, Chris Sinclair, who else? Peter Wickham, who else? Everybody was in the history room. Yeah, yeah, in, in addition to uh, the, the Mavericks, Santa Bradshaw, Kerry Simmons, Kurt Humphrey, <laughs> <laughs> and Lisa Cummins. <laughs> you know, um, they all claim me. Well, those were in my classroom, yes. Good. So this evening, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to take you on a, a journey. I'm looking at um, the life and times of a particular man. And uh, I know that I'm not speaking, I'm not a great, well, I am a great beard, but how many people in here actually knew Mr. Errol Barrow? Not just you, uh, Senator. <laughs> how many, let me see. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah about half of us, right? The others have heard about him. And the thing is that uh, there is, uh, we still have to be very careful about how he is viewed in Barbados. Because I go to schools, I go to primary and secondary schools and talk about the coming of independence. And, you know, when, when I mention Mr. Barrow, there's a cloud, a cloudiness among the little children. And one day I said, uh, one day I was, I asked one young, what do you know about Mr. Barrow? Um, oh, he's the man on the $50 note. I said, but that's all? Um, he wasn't important? No, sir. Um, so who was more important than he? Um, sir Grant Lee Adams. I said, what? Why do you say so? He's on the $100 mill. <laughs> Serious. He's on the $100 note. <laughs> right? So we, we have a problem there. Now, for those of you, therefore, who do not know about Mr. Barrow, uh, and know of our con 
my connection. I come from St. John, deep in the heart of St. John. Did not leave St. John until age 20 when I went on to Mona campus, but I went to St. John's mixed school and from there to the Lord's school. And the president talk about Barrow as a social engineer. I got to know about Mr. Barrow in the election of 1956. And that just shows you how far back I go, right? When Mr. Adams and the Barbius Labour Party were striding around the place, cock a hoop, they were controlling everything. And as a matter of fact, in St. John, my former headmaster, Mr. Luther Thorne, he resigned, he retired from being headmaster and went directly into uh, elective politics, got him um, elected for St. John and became Minister of Education. How many of you remember Luther Thorne? You don't, right? Uh, scarcely, right. But, and what was important about that election of 56 is that the DLP, the Democratic Labour Party, as happened in 2018, got a wipeout, a wipeout. I think that Mr. Barrow, who had emerged as one of the leaders, he, was, he lost his seat in St. George uh, to the Dowdens and Freddie Miller, right, et cetera. He came third in that election, right? So he was in the political wilderness. And I don't know, but my mother, well, I can't even say she was of a different political persuasion from myself. I was just about eight years old. And I just said, she said, I'm glad. I don't like, he, he looked like a bullfrog. <laughs> that is Errol Bow she was talking about, right? But, um, well, she's a different generation from me. Born in 29, was uh, able to vote in 51. And she had been through several people who, or she had come under the influence of people who ran for Barbados, like Blackman, Owen T. Alder, and, and she saw people, she saw she would have seen Sir Grantley come up there, lending his help and strength to what, to the, the uh, Barbados Labour Party. Uh -huh. So she, there's no accounting then for her, um, her orientation, if not affiliation. So I got the idea that this man was uh, something, somebody to be afraid of, somebody who to, uh, to uh, more or less not gravitate to us. But then I was eight. I was born in 48, so by 56, I was eight years old. Um, 58, 1958, I left St. John's Mixed School and I passed for the law school. Now, Reggie would tell you that in those days, passing for the law school or Harrison College was like passing for Yale, Princeton, Harvard, Oxford and Cambridge, com right, Reggie? Combined, not only were they the rich people's school, we had to pay money, $24 a term, and at large it was $28.50. I say that because uh, somehow I got a vestry scholarship, which took away $16 from the $28.50. So my mother had to pay $12.50, and she a single mother with four children, a domestic, and don't know how she scraped it together. But one thing I know is that she did not engage in prostitution, <laughs> right? But, you know, but, but I went to Lodge, 58, 59, paying 12, 50. 59, 60, paying 12, 50. 60, 61. Then came the, in the election of 1961, in December 1961. And, pardon me? Could you put your thing on his mouth? <laughs> <laughs> right on. Yes, I bet you don't know what day of the week. Got to. Yeah, Thursday, the 4th of December. And um, the Democratic Labour Party was swept to power. You remember the tune? Um, sweep them out of the council, sweep them out. <clears throat> We need a clean and proper government, sweep them out. You got the broom in your hand, we help you sweep them out. Sweep them out of the council, sweep them out. 
Now, that's why I tell you, people do not know these things. Right. Uh, all, you, all you know is what? Uh, all hands on deck. Hail the skipper elect. But you don't know sweep them out of the council. You had a broom. <laughs> she had a broom. Excellent. Good. So we, so we had a change of government. The DLP became the leader, the government of the day, and the opposition party in parliament. Can anybody guess who constituted the opposition party? <laughs> President, could you? The second time I'm asking. <laughs> Put a button on Reggie's. Uh, not Sir Grantley Adams and the Barbados Labour Party. By then, Sir Grantley was in Trinidad, right? You know who became? You know who became with the Federation? You know who became the official opposition? The Barbados National Party, the Motley Group. The Motley Group. Fred Goddard. Who else? Um, the number the. Uh, the number of people, Wilkinson, Greenwich, all those kinds of people, right? They, yeah, and Louis Lynch. These were, and Stanley Dexili. These were the people in a, a largely white group, which emerged in the 1940s as the Electors Association. And then they, in the 1950s, they became the Progressive Conservatives. And now by 1961, they were the Barbados National Party, or... Everybody called them. What do people call them, Reggie? That group. That party. BNP. The Motley, the Motley team or the Motley group with the emphasis on Motley, M-O-T-L-E-Y, meaning <laughs> all sorts and conditions of people. The Motley, the main black man in a white party. It's very, very important because we're talking about Bob Barrow and a social, as a social engineer, et cetera. 1961 marks a revolution in Barbados. And lots of people don't understand that. 1961, up to 1961, I was paying 12.50 at the law school. Um, people were paying uh, 12, uh, $24 at Harrison Queens. People were paying $8 at St. Michael, eight at Courage Parry, eight at Foundation, the Aline, et cetera, right? There is a notion going around, and it's perpetrated by a good friend of mine. He was in my class at Caveville, Dan Carter. Dan Carter argues that, oh, free secondary education came into being in Barbados in 1952 with the establishment of St. Leonard's by Grantley Adams. That is an absolute figment. It is an absolute figment. It was free, but it was not secondary. Secondary education could be had at the modern, at uh, Greenwich, et cetera, for which you paid, and at Lodge, Harrison College, Combermere, et etc. et cetera, et cetera. The people who went to those schools, when they reached fifth form, they sat Oxford and Cambridge. When they got into sixth form, they did the same ONC A level, and they could step straight from Barbados into Oxford, Cambridge, Princeton, Yale, et cetera. I had hopes and dreams of going straight from law school, sixth form, to Oxford. But you had to get a Barbie scholarship. I didn't get one, so I, got, I went on to Mona. But the point is that with regard to education and educational opportunities for black people, yes, the Grantley Adams team introduced um, a grouping of a new concept in education. Here's where you ask Reggie. Not to say anything. Which came first, Reggie? The all age or comprehensive? Comprehensive. Comprehensive. It was not secondary education. You went, look, I have something here about Ellerslie, but I wouldn't um, stop to read it. Ellerslie came into being as a school, um, a kind of, what do we call it now? Um, uh, whew, the word escapes me, but it, were, um, it is a, a grouping or an entity to which, into which you throw everything and everybody. No, 
No, no, that's not it. Uh -huh, I, I remember in a few minutes. But allegedly took its children from people around Black Rock, the primary school. You did not have to pass an exam to go into Ellerslie. You did not have to pass an exam to go into St. Leonard's or Princess Margaret or West St. Joseph. It was therefore not secondary. It was free. But Dan Charter keeps saying, and before him, the late Leonard Shorey. Oh, the uh, uh, Sir Grantley Adams introduced free secondary education. All that Mr. Barrow did was expand it. That is not true. That is not true at all. And I will go to my grave saying that. What Sir Grantley Adams did is introduce the British concept of the comprehensive, the uh, excuse for secondary education into Barbados. And the very fact that you did not have to write an exam to go into that school disqualifies those schools for be, uh, having secondary education. Indeed, the uh, curriculum syllabus had people doing hygiene, needle craft, huh? nutrition, etc. right? Huh? They did uh, nature study, etc. It was just a continuation of your seventh standard education at the primary school. Good? And you did not have to pay. Good? And when you reached fifth form, you read, there was a school leaving exam and you, you did not have to take the school leaving exam. But when you left, you could go and become a postman, an auxiliary worker in the hospital, um, other working class jobs. You could not go to Oxford or Cambridge. You couldn't even go to the University of the West Indies, which emerged in 1963. Right down at the Trade Center, good, and which removed, which moved up to uh, Cape Hill in 1967. It was not free secondary education. Who brought free secondary education to Barbados? Errol Walton Barrow. And this is the point that we must make, right? And I'm not, you know, my friend is raising the flag, but it is a point of, it is a point of accuracy, historical accuracy. So anytime you see Dan Carter making his points again, you know, write and, and, and correct him. Because he and the Barbados Labour Party, they continue spreading what is, well, a terminological inexactitude. I wouldn't call it a lie, <laughs> right? Good. But then, you know that, oh, pre-secondary education, and all Mr. Barrow did was top up. No, he did not. He did not. What Mr. Barrow saw in England happening is that the working classes in the post-war situation, 1950s, he left England in 1950. He himself was able to get a two degrees, economics and law, from University of London. He saw that the Labour government in England, which uh, succeeded um, Winston Churchill, that they had a revolutionary attitude towards education, that the British working classes had fought in the uh, Second World War. They had done tremendously, Battle of Britain, et cetera, et cetera. And now you needed to reward them. So the, the universities were now uh, opened to uh, the British working classes and also the major public and the really private schools were also open to the British working classes. So there was an educational and sociological revolution Barrow saw occurring in Britain. He came here. And he saw that you could go to uh, Corish Parry. Some very bright people went to Corish Parry. Erskine, Sandiford, et cetera, right? You went to Corish Parry, and when you got 17 and you were in fifth form, you left school, and there was nothing for you to do. Go to the civil service, or um, Reggie will correct me, pick pong grass. <laughs> No, pick one grass was for the 11-year-olds. Right. But the point is, Mr. Barrow said, well, this cannot work. It cannot work. So, 61, when he had the opportunity, he introduced free secondary education. And there are those of us who consider Barrow, when we talk about social engineering, we think in terms of his introducing uh, what? Voting at 18, 1962, introduction of the Senate. Um, 
and those kinds of things, even pursuit of university, pursuit of getting, um, what do you call it, independence. But to my mind, the most sensational, the most fundamental practice of Mr. Barrow, exercise Mr. Barrow, is to free up those 17 year olds who could not get an education. Consequently, consequently, from 1961, fees were abolished at the law school. So my mother didn't have to pay 12 50 any longer. I could say glory, hallelujah, right? And uh, nor did you have to pay fees at Combermere. And furthermore, and this is a point of this part of the social revolution about which people do not understand. People who went to Combermere had to uh, suffer the indignity, Mr. President, of being motley children. They had to go in the park and get, uh, get uniform, uniform material. When they went to, into Combermere School and at lunchtime, there was a separate line for them, right? They were more or less on the dole. They were known as motley boys. And up to the point, up to the point of the 1960s, Reggie, right? Mr. Motley was known for the four Ps that he doled out to people, right? What are those four Ps? Pots, pans, panties, and pants. <laughs> Am I wrong? In Queen's Park, he doled out those things to people. Pots, pants, panties, and pants. Right? And that was his control over the city. Over the city. Clientelism, they call it. Which is the American system of garnering support at the polls by doling out to people, yeah, the most minimal, minimal kinds of, um, what, creature comforts, huh? So people went to, into the park, and who is it? Who is it, uh, the Jamaican dub singer? Raise your hand and show me a panty size. <laughs> that happened with Motley in the park. That happened with Motley. Yes, you know, and Mr. Barrow ended that. He ended that. A lot of you see, and this the, this does not come into the the books which are written about Mr. Barrow because most of the books that were written about him concentrate on uh, what happened after '63, the introduction of university. Uh, what by '65, that Barrow's decision to pursue unilateral or insular uh, independence. By 67, the movement of the uh, campus up to Cave Hill. By 69, the introduction of the Samuel J. Prescott Polytechnic. By 68, the introduction of Barber's Community College. These are seen as, Bar as um, Mr. Barrow's contribution. But I think that that fundamental, uh, that fundamental stroke that he made was in 61, which is eliminating clientelism from Barbadian politics, not entirely because Mr. Motley still continued. Mr. Motley still continued to control the city. And there is the argument that Mr. Barrow said, if I can't get Motley out of the city, we get the city out of Motley. We don't know if that is true. We historians are still looking at that. But the local government system by then had become almost superfluous, right? And it was the basis of clientelism. By clientelism, I mean, and you, perhaps you know it by now, you understand by now, that you have, in the same way that a doctor has patients, politicians have clients. And you, as we said, you, Mr. Motley's journeyed to Queen's Park. And Peter Wickham's mother was the lady who helped Mr. Motley dispense pots. <laughs> what else? Pots. No, there were five. I left out one. Pots, poles, panties. <laughs> yes, poles. Yes, chamber pots. Mr. Motley dispensed chamber pots to the people as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the people of the city, the most abject pro property people. So Mr. Barrow decided to end that. Good. So 861, therefore, for my mind, identifies him as the social engineer, which Dr. Yearwood, uh, 
more or less considers him. And remember that this, his notions of emancipating these people from cultural and economic slavery came from his, his great, his uncle, Charles Duncan O'Neill. All of the policies of the Democratic Labour Party uh, established in 1955 came from the Democratic League of Charles Duncan O'Neill, 1923, 24, 25, right? And if you look, look back at uh, Duncan O'Neill's policies, and he was not able to introduce them because he got into parliament in 1932 and served until 36. He did not have time enough to introduce them. But his nephew took those to heart. And his nephew also saw, uh, his nephew saw Clement Payne. We, we are not aware yet of what there was the connection between himself and Clement Payne. But he, we know that he saw Marcus Garvey. He went into Queen's Park and he saw and heard Marcus Garvey speaking. He was therefore infused with a large amount of uh, socialism, black socialism, and the idea of helping your fellow man without reducing them, reducing them to the, uh, to the motley level. Right? And this was bolstered by his experience in England. Right? So 61, therefore, to my mind, marks the parting of the ways between the old Barbados, the old Barbados of privilege. Privilege. I mean, I could spend the rest of the night telling you about Lord School, about Lord School and uh, the inbred, the, the basic racism which pervaded there. And I must tell you people that you've, what you have heard about Lord School surrounds the fact that it had a boarding establishment. It had been a boarding school from the 1820s. And, and there was a time when the boarding element was about 50%. Please disabuse yourself of the notion that is the borders, the white borders who were the racists. The racist element in the law school came from the Barbadian planter class. The Barbadian planter class, right? I can tell you, the Barbadian planter class. I'm a little boy walking to blood school on morning and the rain falling. And if the man from Cottage, uh, young Mr. Clark, who is now with uh, Sajikar, right? His father's bringing up the children to, um, to lodge, three or four boys. And if only the boys are in the class and his car, I can get a ride. The day that that girl going to Cottington High School is in that car, <laughs> the rain could be falling bucket to drop. I could not get in that car, right? Codrington High School exists three quarters of a mile from law school. I went to law school from 1958 to 67. I never spoke to a girl from Codrington High School. Why? They were lighter in complexion than anybody else in here. They were your beige and whites, good? And I always remember uh, the girl Frances Chandler. Frances Chandler one day looking at me and said, you boy, you boy. And I, ignored her until she became an assistant. I said, you me? Yeah, you are. Um, yes, you girl. Because they, that is how they address people at Three Houses Factory, where their father was manager. And she said, you know Paddy Roach? I said, yes, and if I do, um, you can go and tell him that we out here in the car and we waiting for him. I said, miss, <laughs> you know something? You can walk through here on your own. Go and tell him. You know, she had me in her mind from then. She had me in her mind from then. And I can tell you that I remember before she died, the, the plaque, which is on the boardwalk, indicating that at Criano, that the enslaved people landed there. It blew down one day. And I wrote a letter to the newspaper indicating that she, it had blown down and should be taken up. The woman wrote back and said, look, there Trapper Marshall goes again, drawing attention to himself. If he was felt so badly about it, but why didn't he pick it up himself? But we didn't expect, you didn't expect anything better or different from them. But let me advise, let me repeat the point that these schools were hotbeds of racism. Harrison College, no less, but Harrison College had the leavening aspect of the Barbadian brown skin middle class, going to Harrison College, 
but Lord's school was a straight division between planter class whites and uh, some people like uh, David Simmons, Fred Gollop, whose parents were middle class and civil service and civil servants and myself working class, not your borders. So this disabuse yourself of that notion. I mean, I was in Canada studying and I met at uh, a campus, a fellow called Mahabir from Trinidad and we hugged one another and people wanted to know how oh, you could, you know, yeah, we went to the same school, we went to the same school. And we therefore had a bond, you know, we, as brothers, right? So the point has to be made that schooling, right, in up, at, up to the time of independence, that schooling marked you out in Barbados. And it continued after independence, the racism and the particular uh, control of education by white people in this island. And Mr. Barrow did his utmost to break that. He did his utmost to break that. And, don't, and please remember, ladies and gentlemen, that girls, girls could only go to um, Alexandra in the north, right, St. Michael, Girls Foundation, and Queen's College. And here's something that you must know that Mr. Barrow destroyed. You wrote the exam. You wrote the exam. Every school had its own exam. It's common entrance, it's entrance exam, not common entrance. You wrote, I went to law school and I wrote, that's the only place at which I wrote an exam. Some people went to Combermere, Harrison College, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know the particular days on which these people had the exams. Let me tell you, and God can strike me down if I tell any lies. In, after the exam, right, you were asked to stay back. And I always remember that a, a slim, sandy-haired fellow with shorts, glasses, he, and affable, wearing a smile, uh, came to us and which of you is Trevor Marshall? Yes, sir. Come with me, please. Went into a room and he said, you're a bright boy. You got some good um, answers to these questions. I just want to find out a bit more about you. So quite all right, sir. This was the interview which decided if you would go to Queens, Harrison College, Foundation, or Lodge. The questions, and Reggie you don't know this. There's one thing you don't know, right? The questions followed as such. What work does your father do? Now, my father had been drawing canes with a truck, and in 1957 or so, he got a pick in the audiovisual aids as a uh, driver operator with the mobile cinema. And I remember somebody telling me, George, but you got your good grazing. So what, man, no, no rain can't fall in that money, man, you're a civil servant. So this 10 year old boy remembered and when the man asked me, what work does your father do? I said, civil servant, gone clear. <laughs> the second question was, are your parents married? Now, I belong to the outside woman. <laughs> In fact, my father had two ladies, impregnated both and married one. My mother. Was <laughs> but my mother, my stepmother, with whom I had a good relationship, you know, had, she was kind to me. So, your parents married? I said, yeah, my father and mother. I'm stepmother. Yeah. So, I answered, yes. <laughs> yeah. Gone further clear. The, you know, the Americans operate on the basis of three strikes and you're out. The killer question was, when you got up this morning and you got ready to come to this exam, where from did you get water to, to bathe? And ladies and gentlemen, you can answer by using any letter of the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, T. You had to leave out S. You could not say standpipe because if you say standpipe, three strikes and you are out. Because the schools operated on the basis of what 
uh, Dr. Yerwin would call the Bogardus social distance test. They did not want poor, uh, dispossessed, disadvantaged people in those schools. So you had to be able to support, your father had to be able to support yourself. There had to be respectability in terms of uh, the nuclear family, father, mother, and child. And most of all, you had to live in a house in which there was indoor plumbing. Mr. Barrow stopped that. Mr. Barrow stopped that. Remember, good? you could now go to any school. The maid could go to the school at which her 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 um bought her employer's children could attend. My good friend at Lord School, some of you must know him, Randall Strong. He became com control of customs. But to me is just Randolph or Penny Face or Cable Line. We all had nicknames and came from venture. And and the plantation next it was Easy Hall. And Apparently, morning, he's riding up to law school, and the lady at Easy Hall, the white lady, looks through the window and sees him. And her mother was work his mother was working there. Said, Mrs. Strawn, or Strawn, because he didn't call you, but you Mrs. or what? Just Strawn. Yes, ma'am. That is your son riding in law school uniform? Yes, ma'am. Well, Miss Strawn, Strawn, what is Barbados coming to? If all these children go into law school, who are we going to get to cut the canes? As God is my witness, that was said. Good. And remember, remember, I am going to law school. I'm 11, 12, and I'm passing to Colleton and Society of Plantation. And I hear people shit. I hear boys' voices calling for me. And when I look, they're 11 and 12 year old boys in the cane fields working. Up to the 1960s, we had child labor. Child labor was supposed to be abolished in the 1940s. It was still there in the 1960s. Mr. Barrow eradicated it. He eradicated it. All right? So if I've dwelt a lot on this, let me make the point over and again but that Mr. Barrow freed an entire generation who could only be freed through education. And remember, thank you very much. Remember while you're applauding, remember parts of that generation? Owen Arthur. Owen Arthur is one of those people coming from St. Peter, going to uh, Corridge Parry, right? And then to Harrison College. And he and others like him were freed by Mr. Barrow, right? So I don't know if you can call it ingratitude or whatever, <laughs> but political... Uh, Political uh, di um, realities dictated that you you swing where you can get a seat in Parliament, etc. But the point that I'm making is that Mr. Barrow, the social engineer, liberated an entire generation. Not just boys, not just boys, good, but girls as well. Have a gir girls as well, and he, and we come to the point that in 1963, 1962, as a matter of fact, good. He did, he did the, the unthinkable. The University of the West Indies had been set up in 48. And one campus, Mona, I must tell you, I'm part of the Mona Mafia. <laughs> when we get together, we talk only about Mona and the Mona moon. And that Mona is 600 acres. And you can walk from now to Merritt never every morning. And you had your selection of all the young ladies from all across the Caribbean. Yes, yes, yes. And we had an excellent education. And I met Ralph Gonzalez, Trevor Monroe, Michael Manley, uh, you know, uh, Patrick Manning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I am a proud Monaite. In 1960, who said me to? <laughs> yes, thank you. Ah, yes, my dear. C. Cole, Taylor Hall. Right. <laughs> huh? Um, you see, the, Mona has only one hall, that's Taylor. The others are places. <laughs> right. <laughs> the point is that by 62, Mr. Barrow, a large-scale thinker, 
I'm saying, you know, saying, and better tell me sometimes I have a barrel voice, guttural and deep. I can't stand sending these children to Jamaica every year, costing the treasury a lot of money. I think I better set up my own campus here. Y'all have heard about Paul Kings Douglas, or Atanti Merle. Who tell he say that? Bustamante, when he heard about it, said, blood seed, me rotted, bumbo clot, ras clot. You think that, where, where? You think we're going to take our money and plow into a campus in Barbados? No, sir. Blood clot. Eric Williams in Trinidad said, hey, hey. Hey, Barrow, you know, my grandfather was a Barbadian, but your mama guy and me, where do you think it is? You think I got all money to help one? Huh? Hey, hey, my all money to help a, 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 a campus in Trinidad. 1960, just two years ago, we established our own campus. You will send your children to, to Trinidad to do engineering, agriculture, right? We are not putting any of our petrodollars into a campus in Barbados. And borrow the bullfrogs and I want all the money. We are going to spend our own money. We're going to establish our own campus. I bet you all didn't know that. You all didn't know that. And the swellers said, okay, uh, pigs will fly. Right? In other words, you can't get it done. By 1963, Mr. Barrow had not only got it done, but he had established these class classes started at St. Michael. We just down the road here, and the science classes were down at Reggie World Trade Center, right at the harbor. And people think that we started at Cape Hill. No, we moved up to Cape Hill in '67. But in 1963, Mr. Barrow achieved the unthinkable. He had a university campus. Now we must contradistinguish this from what. The Grantly Adams people thought. All along we've been talking about Mr. Barrow, but we've not been looking at him in, in relation to uh, Grantly Adams. We backtracked to indicate that the Barbados Labour Party in the 1950s did not see the necessity of emancipating children from financial and educational deprivation. They never had the idea of establishing free secondary education. They thought they introduced the comprehensive schools, St. Leonard, West St. Joseph, uh, Princess Margaret, right? Yes, and the, the idea was, uh, as Dr. Year would know, Plato, Plato, men of gold, men of silver, and men of brass. The idea was the men of brass would be educated at your comprehensive school. Bobby, uh, uh, Barrow moved beyond the platonic concept and said everybody must be a person of, of gold. Everybody, the maid, her son or daughter has to have the opportunity to go to not only Queen's College and pay no fees, but also to go to Cape Hill. And thus it happened. Thus it happened and in the 1960s. So, 63, he further distinguishes himself as a social engineer by introducing uh, the campus uh, at Cape Hill. And I mean, you don't have to be Dr. Ronnie Yero to understand. Look at who has come out, look at who have come out of Cape Hill from St. Lucia, Anthony. Uh, name them. Huh? Huh? Keith Mitchell Grenada, Daikon. Daikon is was at Cape Hill with my son, Grenada. Huh? Antigua, Vance Emery. Um Name them. Huh? No, Ralph is Mona. He taught at Cape Hill. He taught at Cape Hill. But I mean, people who went through Cape Hill as students. Because Gonzi, Gonzi was my guild president at Mona. Right? But Cape Hill has more than distinguished itself, has more than established itself as a worthy addition to the campuses of the UWI. There are now five. Remember there's one in Nassau, Bahamas for the teaching of tourism and uh, hotel management. And there's a Five Islands one in Antigua. But it is always said that of the three main ones, 
the most brilliant, the most consistent, the best run is that of Cave Hill. Right? And that is, thank you. And that is due to the, that is due really to the foresight of uh, Mr. Barrow. And do you know how we got that campus? I have the photograph, but I couldn't find it to bring and show you. There's a picture of him and J. Cameron Tudor, so James Tudor, standing on what was called, not the Mount, um, God, what's the name? What's Cape Hill known as? Uh, yeah, where the university is now. No, it was not just the Mount. It was, anyway, we don't know anymore. But it had a lot of dunks, trees, dunks, trees, and around it, etc. right? And Mr. Barrow was looking for a campus. And he said, oh, oh Ma Mona is a sugar plantation. St. Augustine is a sugar plantation. No, we Barbadians, we're an island, and we're close to the sea. I want a campus overlooking the sea. So he and uh, Cameron Tudor got in a light airplane and flew over, right? That year, Montgomery, etc., and saw Cape Hill and noted its possibilities. Landed, you know, and went up there and looked around. And the die was cast. This will be the campus. And Camp Cape Hill is now considered as being the most salubrious. That means healthy looking of the campuses. It, it has, what, it was what, three, 400 feet above sea level. It looks down on the Atlantic. And by the way, we are not in the Caribbean Sea. <laughs> right? All of around us is Atlantic. But it looks over the West Coast. And that, that's Mr. Barrow. There were notions that he should have put the campus at Codrington College, my own parish, St. John. All right, with its long association with learning. Good. But... He considered that with the vagaries of the bus system, people from what, the north, would have to take 12 miles to Bridgetown and then 12 miles to where <laughs> Owen Arthur lived. So it was better to have it in a central location, that being uh, Cape Hill, just outside Bridgetown. So Mr. Barrow had foresight, had foresight, and he had, you know, and also he had a kind of bulldog attitude. If you saw Mr. Barrow, you know, the, the cheeks puffed out. <laughs> you know, look at that, look at that there. That's a, a bulldog man there. Remind you, reminds you of Marlon Brando as the godfather. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, except that he had a, a bigger voice than Brando, right? And when he spoke, you listened, unless you were Tom Adams or Lammy Cry. <laughs> 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 we were his nemesis. So Mr. Barrow decided, as we said, that Cave Hill would be the spot. And he has seen, well, he died in, what, 87. And the campus had, had only completed, what, 20 years. But it attracted numerous persons, people of academic uh, excellence, uh, we are we in the history department. We can claim that everybody who's anybody has come through here, has come through there. We've had uh, the El Segovia lecture um, every year. I can claim that El Segovia taught me at Mona. Um, the people in the sciences can also claim. We've even had people at CERMES qualifying for United Nations. Um, what is it? Nobel Prize, right? Uh, we've had law faculty, second to none in the region, all anchored at Cape Hill, right? And everything. And the thing is that Mr. Barrow's touch at Cape Hill was light. You never saw him heavy-handedly coming in there and saying, oh, this has to happen. He just let Cape Hill govern itself, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you again, right? And that is his touch throughout uh, the time that I knew him and I, I observed him, uh, coming back to the point about knowing the man, 
not only did I see him in St. John in 61, but I saw him again in 66. And remember in 66, he introduced what? No, 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 early 66. But no, no, even before 66. Um, the Senate, he changed the Legislative Council and made it the Senate. He, yeah, 65. And then he also introduced the concept of 18-year-olds voting. Now, 19, yeah, 1950, 1950, the Grantley Adams government introduced what we thought was earth-shattering. And for we introduced, they introduced what? Uh, the, right, universal adult suffrage, which meant that anybody 21 and over and not being in jail could vote. My mother voted for the first time in 51. I suspect that's why she had an affiliation with the Barbary Labor Party. But by 66, I was 18 and in law school, sixth form. I voted. I voted in the election of 1966. Okay? But we want to mention of 1966 brings us to another point that is not often considered when we're thinking of Mr. Barrow. He decided in 1965, he decided in 1965 that uh, the Federation having come to a sorry end, the Grantley Adams Federation, and that the negotiations with the, the little aid being bogged down over questions of where the capital would be, etc. Mr. Barrow decided, look, the unthinkable, we are going for insular independence. And, um, well, I was a performer at law school at the time. I remember Mr. Alexander Hoyas, uh, Fabriciano Alexander Hoyas, our history teacher, call him a mad one. We can be, you survive, how can you survive? But the point is, what point Mr. Bar Mr. Hoyas and the other people did not know? 1964, windfall. Windfall, the returns from sugar were excellent that year. By 1964, tourism, tourism, the Hotel AIDS Act was now generating quite a lot of, um, con, uh, con, quite a lot of interest throughout the region. People were not only going to the traditional haunts of tourists, uh, Haiti, Cuba, Jamaica, Bermuda, they were seeking this Eastern Caribbean paradise called Barbados. And it had no, it did not have any uh, competition from St. Lucia, certainly not Trinidad, not Tobago, right? So the portents were good. Barbados could go ahead. And the point is that by uh, that time, Malta, Malta is not much bigger than Barbados, and other territories were going independent and remaining within the Commonwealth. South Africa had taken itself away from the, the Commonwealth, right? But it has shown that you could strike out on your own and not be uh, beholden to the British Queen as it was then. So Mr. Barrow once again shot the leaders of the region and shot the leaders in Barbados by indicating in 1965, that he was going to, to pursue the concept of, as I call it, insular independence. Barbados would go to independence on its own. Who tell he said that, right? I think that the, the, the records of Hansard, which is the official uh, documentation of parliament, are replete with the vituperation that means scornful criticism, which he encountered, right? By then, Mr. Adams had recovered his uh, situation as leader of the opposition party, right? He was gearing up for the election due in 1966, and he attacked Mr. Barrow viciously, violently, and considerably, right? And in the, when 66 came, Guyana proceeded to independence. So the way was now clear for Barbados. But the, and I'm talking from memory, because I'm in law school, sixth form, and Fab Hoyas is spending time not teaching history, but trying to, 
Dr. Yer, would, would you, would you please? Thank you, Senator Canvassing, trying to recruit people for the Barbados Labour Party. He has succeeded with Nigel Barrow, David uh, Simmons, Winston Pop Walker, Fred Gollop, who else? And he tried now with Trevor Snuffy Marshall. He did not realize that Trevor Snuffy Marshall had been given a lease of life by Mr. Barrow in 1961 with the removal of those $12.50. How could I vote for anybody else? But anyhow, Mr. Hoyas did us a boon by telling us the whole political and constitutional history of Barbados. So we learned that good in the classroom. I must tell you that when the exam came in 67, um, <laughs> he, he was in a panic when Mayor came and he said, um, we haven't done much work, have we? Um, but Snuffy, everybody called me Snuffy. Um, you, wrote the ex you wrote all the essays. Yes, sir. Um, all right, give me them. He went home and put them on a guest set and I typed them out and circulated to everybody, right? The entire class passed with two people getting A's, myself and George Hunt's son. So Hoyas retained his reputation as being a fantastic teacher. <laughs> right. So on a more serious thing, by 66, the noise over independence had spread throughout Barbados. Not only was Sir Grantley Adams adamantly against it, but also Motley, right? And they were, you know, you have to look through Hansard, and you have to hear what happened. There were, as a matter of fact, up and down this the island, especially when uh, they went to England and Lancaster House and the British um, Secretary of State said, you know, um, Mr. Barrett, it seems as though you are not garnering the support of the leaders of the opposition for your concept of independence. So, uh-huh. So he said, um, so what you have to do is go back to Barbados and hold an election. Mr. Barrow had thought of holding election after independence, but the British people decided and, and, and insisted that he hold the election before independence, because, you know, there was strong opposition to independence on the part of the Barbados Labour Party and part of the Barbados National Party. I attended a number of, um, I attended a number of meetings, political meetings at that time. And I remember that in Spite Stone, the leader of the Barbados Labour Party said, if you elect Dipper Barrow and give him the control of this government and we become independent, rivers of blood will flow in Barbados. The Indians, the Syrians, the whites will not be safe in Barbados. Don't elect Dipper Barrow. Right? That was said. That was said, ladies and gentlemen. Not only that. Not only that. Right? The leader of the Barbados Labour Party and the leader of the Barbados National Party boycotted independence. I bet you all don't know that. You know why I know that? You know why I know that? Huh? The, on the night of the 29th of November, I, as a law school cadet, as a law school cadet, a part of the independence ceremony, I was, what, about two lengths of this room from the flag. And we had, there were a long time that you could look around and see. I saw and I counted 43 white people, most of whom were dignitaries from overseas. What's his name? Uh, my great friend, Richard Hoad, <laughs> said I tell him lies. How could I be part of the program and I could see white people? <laughs> but thank you. I also saw no Barbados Labour Party persons there. I saw no BNP persons there. Independence, the 29th and the 30th of November, was of the DLP, by the DLP, for the people of Barbados. And this, and ladies and gentlemen, this, this helps us to understand a number of the moves being made by Ms. Motley. You know, um, 
the elimination of Independence Square as a focus, right? The removal of the independence ceremony from the garrison to Kensington, right? The twinning of uh, Republic Day and Independence at Barbados National Day. All of these are transparent exercises to remove the legacy of Barrow. That, can, can, that is obvious. That's obvious, right? But let me get back to the point about the, the 1966. The British government said, Ms. Barrow, you may have to go back to Barbados and hold an election. Mr. Barrow came back end of um, uh, September and announced that we would have an election. Got you ready, Reggie. Was it the 3rd of November? 3rd of November. She correct? No, she can't be so correct. 3rd of November. I voted. <laughs> That's my sister-in-law. She... <laughs> No, it was the third, third of November, right? We we'll check. Thank you. But it's good to have these interventions. So, you know, it was a rush, and Mr. Barrow, I think, and Mr. Hoyas, when we got back to school, uh, the Democratic Labour Party won fourteen of the seats. The Barbados Labour Party ten. Motley was eliminated. And we said, Mr. Hoyas, we were, we were gloating. What happened now? He said, oh, we won a moral victory. He said, I said, sir, how come? Oh, we got more votes than the DLP. You know why, Reggie? They braced down and said, Michael, which are now 10 constituencies, were just two. Right. So you had most votes in St. Michael and braced down. But that is what Mr. Hoyas loved. Right? We, have, we won a moral victory. However, Mr. Barrow won 14 seats and proceeded to independent. And that was helter skelter, pell mell. We had 20 odd, 24 days to get ready for independence. We had to learn this song poem, independent, independent, in what? In plenty and in pack and kind of knee. We had to learn this tune, which was two, two minutes long. And I remember Mr. Hoyas got into the classroom and lambasted the. <laughs> <laughs> the independent, the, 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 the national anthem, right? And all of the Barbados Labour Party people lambasted everything to do with independence. And there are people who up to today have nothing to do with independence because of that animosity generated at that time and supported by their party, right? But Mr. Barrow ignored it. He went ahead. And I always say, um, that we were accustomed at that time to a number of anthems. And, you know, and the people who had the anthems in Barbados were the sugar workers. And you know what the anthem was? Cut the sugar cane till it bun me hand. Sugar cane growing on my native land. Cut the sugar. All right. And the fishermen had their anthem. Pull them, horsemen. Pull them, horsemen. Pull them. Pull. Right. And the bread sellers had their anthem. Miss Matty does make some big, big bread. Got in soda to kill you. Although she know the time so hard, she won't keep out Kendall. All those people, those are people to whom the Democratic Labour Party appealed. And they were there on that night of independence. Right? And, you know, as I said, we are part of a country of National anthem. Do you remember the an anthem was God save our gracious queen <laughs> or noble queen. You know, God save the queen. Send her victorious, happy and glorious, long to reign over us. God save the queen. When you're watching World Cup today, you see the British singing it, <laughs> the English singing, right? And that was, so we had so many um, non anthems. In fact, I was telling some people today, even we, the little children, had a, an anthem. John Belly, Mama, Dick Dick, Sam. John Belly. <laughs> art, art, art. <laughs> so, 1966 was a year of anthems. 
But we did not know we could not sing the national anthem until that night. And let me tell you something, and a lot of you people don't know it, but I was there on that night, as I said, as a cadet. Huh? You were there. Right. Thank you. And I was close as a cadet. Not only was I uh, one of the people, we, we did George Bell, Matt Fingal, and a number of us, we did some baton swinging with lights, and we were dressed in white. And as I said, we were about 50 meters from the flagpole. And, um, and the next morning, when we moved from the garrison, um, I was lead drummer of the Combine Cadet Band, which suggested I was the best drummer. The Combine Mayor, Harrison College and Lodge. There's evidence to show that. <laughs> yes, because when Rand Allstrand said, drummers, band and drummers ready, click, click, click. By the center, quick, mark. You're convinced? <laughs> So we went there on the night of the 29th of November. And I keep asking children, why the 29th of November, if they depend? And somebody said, we don't know, sir. They want it to be early. I said, why? <laughs> but, sir, Independence was the 30th. I said, what time at the 30th? Midday. He said, no. Up to today, I was lecturing at Erdiston, and I tell them that the independence program began at 10 o'clock on the night. Reggie wasn't even there. <laughs> right on. So we, you know, the, the, uh, they had a variety concert, and then, and then, you know, again, Mr. Barrow, you know, I keep saying, a social and cultural engineer. He brought two groupings to perform on that night. And you know one of them? What one of them was? A group that met in the bus stand and wore turbans. And you know what they were called by Barbadians? The Mad Head Tie Heads. Huh? Granville Williams' group established in 1957. People considered them to be Obia people. Um, everything that was bad. And I remember you catching the six o'clock bus to, to St. John. And one night I was so entranced by like six o'clock bus gone online and left me. <laughs> but my father was working at AVA and I called him up and I got home. Entranced by the, because these people, I once was lost in sin and Jesus took me in. And then a little light from heaven killed my soul. It saved my soul from doubt and turned me inside out. And just a little talk with Jesus make the oh, now let us have a little talk with. All right, all right. <laughs> and um, but um, but prayer to that. They had never appeared on a national stage. Let me make the point. Mr. Barrow made spiritual Baptist respectable. That was the first time they ever appeared on the stage. And we accustomed to them in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, crop over can't start without the spiritual Baptist and Bishop Granville, Archbishop, blessing the, the last kings, etc. That started in 1966. What was the other group that Mr. Barrow made respectable on that night? Bum 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 or so it seemed, and they would corrupt the morals of the young girls. And we saw, we went there, and they performed at the Arms House in St. John, now the uh, David Thompson Center. And we saw, you know, rough seas lashing the helm, went to the store, 
to the, and hurricane coming and right hand and right foot and left hand and left foot, right? And two skips forward and two skips back, right? And, that, and all the time, and all the time then. You think it easy? You think it easy? You think it easy? What? When I say I'm a drummer, I ain't making the fun. <laughs> huh? They performed on that night. And ladies and gentlemen, the reaction of the people was if Lil Rick and Marshall Montano had combined and were of that vintage and were performing. I never see people get on like that. Right, they took over the show, but time came on, right? So, 11 o'clock passed, uh, 11.30 passed. You had the religious groupings, uh, Methodist, Moravian, and uh, even the Muslims and the Hindus came and said prayers for Barbados. And we had a few more things. And now it's 10 minutes to midnight. And we want borrow, we want the flag. And people shouting and thinking, and Five minutes to midnight, out step Mr. Step Mr. Barrow and out steps Sir John Stowe, right? And Hartley Dotting, the lieutenant, he's still alive. Hartley comes up with this thing rolled up under his arm. And there's a gentleman from the British Navy. And the, the British Union Jack is on the is up on the mass head. And he stations himself next to it. Hartley Dotting on this side. And you know, and we now have uh, 10 seconds to midnight and they start and we start counting down 10, 9, 8 and the Union Jack is coming down and this one is going up 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5 and they meet halfway and you hear pull it down, pull it down <laughs> and then this one moves up and the British flag comes down and the fella holds it and rolls up under his arm and this one that Hartley Dotting had reaches up to the top of the flagpole. And you know what? They turned off the lights. They turned off the lights, right, Reggie? <laughs> For about five seconds. And then they turn off. Then they turn on the lights again. And Peter Ram sums it up well. Blue, yellow, and black. Put it up. Blue, yellow, and black. Put it up. Man, people scream. People scream as though they were liberated from slavery. People cried. As an 18 year old, I felt some tickling in my eyes as well. But I stood at attention, right? And the cane cutter laughed and cried. The fisherman laughed and cried. Miss Matty, everybody laughed and cried. And out came John Stowe and Errol Barrow, the famous picture. Famous picture shaking hands against the background of the thing. That's how we approach independence, ladies and gentlemen. And then the police band started up. You didn't have to have no introduction. And everybody rose to attention. And we sang in plenty and in time of the, as though it meant something. Meant something. Mr. Barrow's finest hour, or one of his finest hours, right? You know? Well, we would argue if that was his finest hour, but he still had other things to do. You know, he had to introduce the, com the community college, Prescott Polytechnic. He had to introduce in the 1970s, um, NIFCA and crop over. We forget that we did, he did these things. <coughs> National insurance scheme, right? All these things. So when you say it is this finest hour, we, we beg perhaps to, 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 to differ, right? But it was certainly a moment, uh, that will long last in the memory of us persons. I remember the Barbados Labour Party was conspicuous by its absence. Mr. Motley's National Party was also glaringly absent. But, and uh, you know, um, we, nowadays when you, very few people raise this point because that is still an area, not necessarily an area of darkness, but an area of cloudiness. And I'm sure that for a number of you here, my recitation of what happened on that night is the first time you're hearing it. Because people hear that, oh, we went, uh, Mr. Barrow, 
decide on independence. And some people may say he went up to England, some do not. Some people say, oh, and on the, the 30th of November, we got independence. But they did not know the struggle Mr. Barrow went through, right? Uh, Mr. Barrow had to fight against the white Barbadians. The white Barbadians who decided that they would change their passports. Huh? They would take out British passports and they would go back to Britain, to Canada, Australia, and New Zealand because they could not stand the idea of uh, being ruled by King Kong. They call him King Kong, big, black, and ugly. They call him all kinds of things. Huh? You know? And worse was to come. Worse was to come. When you read about when the Barbados Community College came into being, you know, the, the, the debate in the House of Parliament was like as though you uh, in Iraq and you discussing something introduced by the Americans that this is the worst thing. The, whoever introduced this bill should, live in, should hang their head in disgrace. Can you imagine that? A bill to further emancipate the working class, a bill to establish a Barbados Community College, a bill to make sure that 2,500 children from uh, non six form schools would every year enter and get an education, the same as those going to Harrison College Company. And the, 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 the opposition party, I would not say the Barbados Labour Party, the opposition party fought against it viciously. Well, well that's, um, that's for independence. But I move beyond that for a moment. I'm just looking at um, the introduction of Community College and Prescott Polytechnic, how they were viciously attacked. I mean, it is, it is incredible. You have to go and look at the documentation that people, you would not believe that people uh, could attack you know, and say that the person who, who introduced this bill should hang his head in shame, right? This is disgraceful. And that it is, it is totalitarianism. Huh? It is controlled by government. But those things were said. Now, nowadays, when I tell my friends and colleagues in the Barbados Party, you know what they say? Oh, that was opposition politics. Opposition politics, I tell you. It was vicious. You know, opposition party, opposition politics can be robust, yes, but not, but you cannot just look at social engineering of the type that Mr. Barrow was trying to introduce and say that whoever introduces this bill should hang their head in disgrace and that the person is a vicious uh, racist, they are vicious totalitarian person, etc. No. So we, we see that at every stage, Mr. Barrow invited, not invited, but he had opposition. He had opposition. Now we talk about the uh, National Insurance Act, etc. We talk about other things. What we do not know is that one of his main pieces of legislation, he did not live to see it come into being. The Tenantry Freehold Purchase Act, right, Reggie? That was his? Freehold Purchase. Yes. Precisely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then Mr. Barrow, then Mr. Adams has gained the credit for it. 81, 1981. But yeah, because he was there, the government had changed precisely. But um, I've said enough to, to tell you that the, that, uh, the legislation in terms of the making Barbados a totally different society that it all has to do with Mr. Barrow. I don't think that, uh, well, I've seen my good friend Ralph Gemma write a book called Three Statesmen, The Two Adamses and Mr. Barrow. 
I deliberately did not read it before look, coming here because Rob and I usually differ of these things, uh, on these things. But I must read it. Um, but I don't know how he could write about the two, three of them in the same breath because they were diametrically opposed in their ideas. And then Mr. Barrow, I, I knew Tom Adams. So Reggie Hunt can tell you that Tom Adams was one of the most vicious politicians we've ever had in Barbados. Mr. Barrow was never vicious. You know, he was robust. He was a doughty opponent, right? He would take you to the wire. But naked viciousness, I saw in, in Tom in 76 and 81, right? Uh, you know, so I could not, I really couldn't um, put the two of them together. As for Sir Grantley Adams, um, friends of mine have suggested that he should never have been a national hero and that he sold out, he sold out Barbados to the whites, etc. Um, as a historian, I have to be balanced. And I have to say that, well, when Clement Payne left Barbados, we didn't have a leader. And Adams was thrust into the position of leader. And therefore, the, the legislation which came into being in the 40s, holidays with pay, pensions, et cetera, is attributed to him. Although the British had decided this is what has to happen. So it didn't come straight from the genius of Adams. It was more or less dictated to him, right? And, but also, I think the, the main thing that Mr. Adams, I can attribute to him, is the creation of the Deepwater Harbor and the Hotel AIDS Act of 56. Both were his projects, all right? But he was a stick in the mud. He was a conservative. Where education was concerned, he did not see the idea of emancipating the mass of the people. He, 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 he had been to Harrison College, Barbara Scholar. His son had been to Harrison College, Barbara Scholar. His wife taught at Queen's College, and he saw the society as continuing with this. Only a particular level class of people should ob uh, obtain that education. And he, he really went to his grave thinking that Mr. Barrow had done uh, a violent wrong to the society to um, establish uh, free education for everybody. And he remember he raised the point about where you're going to get the money from. He also objected to the University of the West Indies. So I have problems with Mr. Sir Grantley Adams as a national hero. Now, so we come now to trying to summarize Mr. Barr because I'm Sure, I've kept you over an hour. Right. Uh huh. And there must be time for our questions. Um, how do we look at, as, as the president said, Arabaro, the social engineer, et cetera? Uh huh. And I hope I've, well, I think I've just skimmed the top of what we're saying because I had a vantage point being a St. John person. And seeing Mr. Barrow visit us so often, I had a vantage point from which to view him, both as a person and as a politician. And as a person, I saw, thought he was extremely generous and likable, um, affable. Um, he never, Reggie, help me with this. He, he never, um, what do you say? Held grudges. Malice. He did not. No, he didn't bear malice. He did not bear malice. I mean, and he still was uh, friendly with members of the other party. Uh, although he, I don't think he was a great admirer of Sir Grantley Adams. And with good reason, they fell out in the 1950s and they had opposing ideas as to how Barbados should continue. I've not mentioned Sir Frank Walcott, uh, but his his story is twinned with that of Barrow. Barrow could not have achieved a number of things in Barbados without the stated 
and obvious uh, uh, support and assistance of Sir Frank as a uh, labor union leader, right? And, uh, and I think two men, two men with large egos. And it is a wonder how they coexisted because Frank, if Frank had wanted, Frank could have been leader of a party and fought to become prime minister of Barbados. But he anchored himself in the Barbados Workers' Union and gave Mr. Barrow constructive support. And he was not afraid to critique, criticize Mr. Barrow when the time came. Right. So there is still a lot to look at in terms of Mr. Barrow. Um, I saw him interact with the poor, the needy, the disprivileged, etc. I saw him visit homes, the meanest homes, and as you know, he, a man, he was a man who liked it belly. So he was always, whenever he went to these places, he always sought to alleviate his hunger <laughs> you know, at people's houses. Um, and he, he did a number of things for St. John. People say that he did not establish the, um, what do you say, the infrastructure. Uh, he didn't build a lot of, uh, have a lot of buildings. And he did a, a, a minor urban center in Gall Hill, library, community center, health center, et cetera. People say he didn't do much more than that, but he gave uh, St. John people opportunities for work, opportunities to work on the farm labor program in Canada and elsewhere, opportunities for work in the public service and in the uh, and, uh, construction, et cetera. Uh, he supported the Carl Williams in his early days. A lot of that is not known. And Barrow was a giant of a man. I don't think that people understand that. So when you see little children say that he, he's less than Adams because Adams is on the $100 bill and he's on the 50, it does not tell you the measure of the man, right? And I think that we are still waiting for a definitive book to be written about him. Gene Holder has written about him. Somebody has done his speeches, but I think that um, perhaps a younger scholar than myself, you know, somewhere like that, should undertake to look at Mr. Barrow in his totality uh -huh, from, let's see, 1951, uh, 1950 when he came back to Barbados until 87 when he died. That is a good 30, 37 years, right? And he himself left nothing for us to grab hold of. He left a cookbook. A cookbook. He didn't leave anything about his speeches. Good. And as you know, when he died, he wanted his ashes to be scattered throughout the Caribbean. He did not want any titles, a statue, anything like that. And I think that is an incredible man because he was unlike any other politician I, I knew. Um, he was a godfather, not like Marlon Brando. He didn't kill anybody or order anybody to be killed. But he went out of his way to help people, help people. And uh, people like myself and Owen Arthur are indebted to him because paying $12.50 a term at a school and then have to find books, uniform, et cetera, et cetera, right? And you play for the school, you gotta find your own cricket boots and whites. You gotta find your own football. I played football for large cricket, ran track, all these expenses. And just that $12.50 a term killed you. There are many people who uh, sometimes couldn't go to school. And, you know, when you went to school, you, you had to submit, subsist on bakes. The boys that come from here, you know, they have it now a bread and two. But that was poor people's lunch. 
and they have made it an icon, you know, a bread and two. You can eat a bread and two. A large people will laugh at you. You have to have ham cutter, cheese cutter, salami, <laughs> and those kinds of things. So you have to eat big, right? Mr. Barrow made us, uh, made life for us far better. You know, uh, when he came to the law school um, for our speech there, people looked up to him. And, you know, we, the black boys, you know, we needed to have someone to whom people looked up. And, you know, and it's no wonder that in the 60s and the 70s, people said, keep Dipper Skipper. In other words, let us have Barrow as uh, prime minister until time runs out. Unfortunately for him, uh, the constitutional debate of 1974 was a, a nail in his coffin, um, was not understood then. The Barbados Labour Party objected to the idea of cabinet control of judges, etc. And you know, when they got into power in 76, they didn't change it. <laughs> they did not change it. They've never changed it. Huh? Not a single amendment, but opposition politics, <laughs> you know. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, if I've done anything tonight, it's, uh, I've sketched for you what, to my mind, and this is a personal uh, position, and it is bolstered by my years as a social historian, by uh, affiliation with political scientists, dabbling in, I did what? Intro to politics, I did uh, political philosophy, history of political and international politics in my history degree at Mona. And I think I've been around active politicians enough to be able to hold my own in a debate about politics and Barrow still towers above all others as a magnificent politician and a social engineer. Thank you very much. Yeah. Trouble. Start again, sir. Start again, please, please. I think there's a, yeah. yeah oh. There you are. Yeah, I think he thought that they had called him a communist. And that was all during the, the time leading up to independence. Independence. Yeah. Yeah, well, and afterwards also. Right, well, couldn't say everything, but um, definitely in the 1950s, Grantley Adams was called a communist. You know, he waved the, the red flag with the hammer and sickle, and he sagged the international. So he, there was more reason to call him a communist than to call Barrow. But undoubtedly, Barrow was called a communist. But in those days of the Cold War, anybody who had any ideas opposing democratic socialism are opposing anybody who had any idea opposing conservatism and control of people was called a communist. Nowadays you don't hear it, <laughs> you know. And remember Castro was the beast then. So if you uh, seem to be moving in the direction of Castro and you're called a communist, that could end your political career. All right, so thank you very much. Good night, sir. Uh, could you expound more on the also the birthing of CARICOM, which oh, we yes. know that the later Walton Bar was mm -hmm. instrumental yeah. in bringing the mm -hmm. region and others like Eric Gary and other esteemed gentlemen that you have spoken about. Could you expound a little bit yeah. more of that? And could you also tell me, because I can't remember if Mr. DeLayette Morris Bishop of Grenier was he 
any part in playing or had anything to do with the late Earl Walton Barrow. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much. And once again, let me apologize. I wanted tonight to locate Errol Barrow in the Barbados firmament, right? Because as I said, if I had gone in that direction, I would have been going over material and ground that most people older than yourself know. And I didn't want to do that. I did not want to come in here and waste time by talking. You know, he called Gary a bandit. <laughs> you know, he, he had trouble with the little eight. He had, uh, and you, you know, he was a leader of the attempt to form a rump federation. Good. Um, and one of his major contributions to Caribbean unity is, of course, CARIFTA, the free trade association between Antigua, Barbuda, Guyana, and Barbados, which mushroomed and metamorphosed into uh, CARICOM and um, what's the other one? The CSM, right? So, but that is another, that's another lecture for another time, you see. And uh, you notice that uh, Mr. Barrow took positions opposite to those of Eric Williams and Bustamante and Manley. And he became a leader, a leader in thought in the Eastern Caribbean. In the same way that Ms. Motley is now regarded as a leader of, in thought of the free world, right? Uh, well, not exactly the same way, but as a person speaking, speaking for disadvantaged groups, right? Mr. Mr. Barrow seemed to be the person who held the podium and who spoke for other such persons. Um, with regard to the Eastern Caribbean people, uh, you asked more about Morris Bishop. Bishop and the New Drill Movement emerged in 1979, the 13th of March. You remember they launched the revolution against Eric Gehry. Uh, by then, Mr. Barrow was out of power, but he, he knew of these young Turks, uh, the Morris Bishop and Bernard Cord, et cetera. Now, I must say, <laughs> I've seen a whole heap of people in this. I saw Morris Bishop at Cave Hill. Everybody came to Cave Hill. I saw Bernard Cord in Trinidad at St. Augustine, right? Reggie, I have this one on you. I saw Tubal Uriah Buzz Butler. Can you imagine that? Right. And uh, imagine Butler is a, a person from the 1930s. Of course, I saw Eric Williams, Norman Manley, Buster Manti, Sangster, everybody who was uh, Burnham, everybody who was anybody. Mr. Barrow's time, you know, 76. And by when he came back in 86, 87, uh, Morris Bishop had been executed and, core, and the, the Americans had moved in and had removed uh, the PRG from power, right? But he did, he did offer support, critical support to Morris Bishop and he suggested like everybody else, you know, that Morris Bishop should um, hold elections. And this is what historians have against Morris Bishop, that he did not hold elections and therefore legitimize what his, his, his revolution said power comes out of the barrel of a gun, which is ridiculous in those days, right? But Mr. Barrow, you know, um, you know, to deal with your point, he, he was a Caribbean person. He supported the University of the West Indies concept, although he established a campus here. And people still went off to Mona and St. Augustine. He insisted that the law faculty be put here so that people who come from Jamaica uh, the um, <laughs> Bahamas, Trinidad, Guyana, and come and study here, and that the regional concept and university would survive. Unfortunately, those of us who are university regionalists, 
we have seen the decline of that concept that all of these won. Mona has now become the University of Jamaica, St. Augustine, the University of Trinidad. Um, we were the one which was still regional, uh, but Antigua has its own, et cetera. So, and there's the University of Guyana, where Mr. Barrow fought for regionalism in university. Uh, he fought for free trade. Uh, don't forget also, Mr. Barrow and Mr. Burnham introduced Carrie Festa. Carrie Festa in 1972 came in Mr. Barrow's time. I journeyed to Guyana to attend Carrie Festa. I went everywhere, you know. I even went to Haiti to see a voodoo ceremony <laughs> back in 1991. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've been, I've, I've been at a traveling man, right? And, you know, and these are things which I know about Mr. Barrow, but I did not want, as I said, to recite what, you know, Nurse Drake's, you know, would tell me, well, we know about that altogether, you know. I had to say things tonight that Nurse Drake's did not know. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Jeffers, sorry, sorry, ma'am. did not just take it on his uh, himself to just do independence. He co-opted. I'm told that you can't hear me. Yeah, thank you, much. He co-opted all kinds of people. We were told that he co-opted the darkest league. Um, I know he had a, a, yeah. a cadre of persons who yeah. understand about economics to Thanks. look at whether we were able to pay for the things that we wanted and so on. So he he went to so many people mm. to to get buy-in from them in terms of independence. Yeah. That it was hard then for the under forties or over forties or whatever forties there were, who now claim that they were interested in independence. Um, it was hard for them he, he, he. to fight. Um, to prevent uh, independence yeah. because of his co-opting of Co different, yes. different groups. Yeah. So when, when he did say, all right, we were going to have independence, so many people in Barbados had bought wanted into it. it that, yeah. that the people came out and rioted yeah. for all those who yeah. said that they didn't want independence. Well, you were there on the night of independence. So you know, and you saw, as I said, Tom, Dick, Harry, Larry, and Mary were there, you know, uh, and it was not that they, they came to see a spectacle. They came to see the birth of a country. And you know, one of the slogans then was, we now have a country. Yes, Mr. Jeffers. Spirit of Barrow, repeat the question. Yes, please. where do you see the spirit of Barrow most alive today? In 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 any whichever regard it feels most relevant to you, Mr. Barrow created. I think his greatest creation. Let me speak slowly. He created the black middle class. Mr. Barrow sent the children of maids and poor people to Harrison College, et cetera, free. He sent the children to Cape Hill free. By the 1970s, when you get Oxnards and Wanstead, right, and other heights, parks, terraces, and gardens be emerging, it is the people who had benefited from his social engineering who were now qualifying for loans to get houses in these areas. He created the black middle class in Barbados. This is not known. This is not, uh, I don't have not known, but it is not appreciated. You cannot, you can talk about CARICOM, CARIFTA, you can talk about everything else, right? But the Owen Arthurs, et cetera, benefited from Mr. Burroughs' largesse. 
You know, people got education. They got first, second, and third degrees at Cape Hill. All that they had to do is get on a bus and go to Cape Hill. They didn't have to travel, you know, 1,200 miles to Jamaica or 240 miles to Guyana, to, 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 to Trinidad, sorry. And to my mind, to my mind, that is his largest legacy that he created a black middle class in Barbados. And you look around, right? Um, whether they were supporters of the Barbados Labour Party or else, right? Um, even the president, prime minister, even president prime minister, he, he also helped her by <laughs> Nurse Drake, so you don't let me know. <laughs> right. The present Prime Minister benefited from Mr. Barrow's generosity and perceptiveness. We will say no more. Right? So, you know, there are people, there are um, world leaders. You can think of Lyndon B. Johnson in USA with the Great Society concept. You can think of Franklin D. Roosevelt um, with the idea of social security, giving people pensions, and the New Deal, making work for people. Great people, great ideas. Lee Kuan Yew, making Singapore an island just twice as big as Barbados, right? Making it an economic hub of, of the, um, the Far East. Good. Who else can you think of? Who? Miss Mr. Barrow? No. Oh, world leaders, yes. But, um, and you come to the Caribbean, and you know, you're hard put to find anybody, any leader who ranks alongside Barrow. Burnham tried in Guyana, the Cooperative Republic concept, but that was vitiated by his own racism by squeezing Teddy Jagan and Indians out. And now, you know, you saw the wind, you got the whirlwind. And the Indians will control Guyana until God comes to his kingdom. Right? And that's, that's one of the problems that Mr. Burnham um, created for himself. In addition to killing Walter Rodney, my history professor, who could have, you know, welded the two races. And Mr. Barrow did not engage in any of these vicious activities. He, he allowed the minorities in Barbados to know, the Indians, the whites, the Jews, you can live and work and prosper in Barbados. That is not known. He could have, in 1966, said, all who don't like it, leave. Williams, Williams said that. And Manley, Manley, Michael Manley in the 70s, saying, all you who don't like my socialist policies, there are nine flights to Miami every day. Take one. Mr. Barrow did not engage in that divisive and hate-filled uh, kind of exp exposition of ideas. He made people in Barbados feel comfortable. Right? That it bears repeating that, you know, this Bill Bull Bulldog, King Kong fellows that, that people hated before 1966. By 76, right? Although he, you know, contributed his downfall. They were comfortable with him. They were comfortable with him. And we have seen since then the evolution of the Barrow idea. And Miss Motley is a, a beneficiary of that. The stability, the stability of Barbados came because of Mr. Barrow, right? There, there's... You cannot think of anything that Mr. Barrow, that um, throughout the Caribbean, we were known, we were known for stability, social, economic, political stability, and we were known for the excellence of our education facilities and the products. Both of those are products of Mr. Barrow's imagination and his work. Yes, Trevor. Um, I'm gonna strengthen your point about his um, unifying Barbados, especially with the white um, planter class and all that. He actually appointed Peter Laurie the first white 
Minister Tourism in Barbados. Peter Morgan. Morgan, sorry, Mark. Morgan. Thank you, right. Mark. He, he appointed him. Mm -hmm. And it, it showed that he did not hold any animosity to any race at all. Yeah. He was the unifier rather than the divider. Down the divider. And I, I would contrast that to what is happening now. <laughs> Our society is really divided right now. And I'm also going to say that apart from persons like Owen Alpha standing up to American imperialism shit writer, with the shit writer, Mr. Barr also stood up to um, Reagan, we call, refer to him as a cowboy. As a cowboy. Mm. So I just want to make that point. He, yes, he was a real statesman who was not afraid to yes. stand his ground. Yeah. Uh huh. Well, yeah, and that's one I left out. I thought, sir, I think the president want. Yeah, she, he will wrap up. We're happy you. You wanted to make a point, sir? Uh huh. No, go ahead with Ronnie. Can you identify yourself? <laughs> Good evening, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I want to thank you first for making a good audience tonight for Mr. Trevor Marshall, who is a storeroom of knowledge. He, he wished me to identify myself. I am Reggie Martin. Senator, Senator. Formal. <laughs> and I, I once, I once um, served with Mr. Barrow, not in government, but here at this Democrat Labour Party headquarters as his research assistant. Yes. Um, I was wanted to say one or two things uh, in respect of what Trevor has said. First of all, there was a preparatory committee within the Ministry of Education that was responsible for interviewing persons like how you did. That was broken up and thrown out mm -hmm. when Mr. Barrow and the Democratic Labour Party came into office in 1961. I want to repeat that. There was a committee within the Ministry of Education that used to interview, similarly, interesting enough, history repeats itself, about the same IADB committee that were interviewing our children. Well, I don't have any at that stage yet. My children have gone before that. Beyond that. So you see, history repeated itself because that was true. And that was broken up. When I said so in the Senate, when I was there, the dean said, I didn't know that. I said, Well, there's some things you know, and there's some things you don't know. So in 1969, when the establishment of the community college came on stream, there was a by-election in the city. Remember that Mr. Lynch had died. Yes. And the teachers canvassed left, right, and center against the Democratic Labour Party because they were introducing the community college. So there are a number of things. Of course, Trevor mentioned the Tenetries Act. And I want to repeat this because a lot of people don't know what has taken place in Barbados. In 1965, Dr. Manning, who would own all of that land that ran from Eagle Hall right down to Strathclyde or Paterkin land. You know the law, his name is Manning's land. Manning's land. Yeah. He wanted all of those people to move off of that land. Who the hell you would have put them? Mr. Barr said no. And that is when the, the Tenantries Act of 1965 was introduced. And of course, when the Democratic Labour Party went for independence, the Mannings went to Australia. They were doctors. Well, one was Dr. Allen, one Dr. Manning, the other was Dr. Blades. 
They used to practice there in Boss Vigo. Right? So I just wanted to fill in some of those areas uh, that Trevor had mentioned. But I think you had a long night. I'm not going to say much more. As far, oh, independence. Let me tell you some independence. I lived through independence. It was the most divided time in Barbados in my lifetime. And you just mentioned what is happening now. It has gone full swing. I'm going to say this. It might be controversial. The Barbados Labour Party is not good for Barbados. They're not good for Barbados. I watched the division. I lived through it. I was 17 years old. I could not have voted in that 1966 election. Trevor beat me by a year. Because you were born in 48. I was born in 49. I could not have voted. But I did as much running up and down and canvassing with my aunt and my father. And couldn't, I couldn't land the vote. But I lived through it. And I saw the division in Barbados during that, that 1966 period touches me deeply. Deeply. And I wish to say, I wish to say, Barra, I spent a little time with him. I'm glad that I did. Because he's not a man that bear malice. He's not a man that bear malice. He will tell you the hardest thing now and then tell you, come and drink one of these gin and tonics. <laughs> that kind of person. And there's some other things I'm not going to say that he said to me, even though he died, because I don't believe in that. Saying things because people have died. But a lot of things he said to me. He said a lot of things to Peanuts Morrison as well. Peanuts Morrison was but Mr. Barr trusted him. And Barr was a man that didn't used to look down on people. He was about uplifting people. And I'm glad that I had that opportunity to spend some time with him and to listen to some of the things he said. And I'm going to remain associated with this party. I've been for 55 years until I die. Yeah. Until I die. I started, when I retired, I started to write my book. My friend over there promised to help me write my book over there, Perlene Drake's a motor canvas uh, student. Pauline Drake's Drake's. Paulette Drake, sorry. But she know that she know that her father was a very good friend of mine, Neville Boxman. However, I want to thank you, Trevor, for giving us this lecture again. I thought it was really a lot of food for thought. And you always seem to find the extra whenever you come to give a lecture here. And when you were selected again, once again, to come and give this borough a lecture. I thought it was worthwhile. And Trav, I want to thank you on behalf of the Democratic Labour Party and the, and the committee for once again bringing that knowledge. Because a lot of our people in Barbados do not know from whence we came. And if you don't know where you came from, you certainly wouldn't know where you're going. And I also, before I sit down, I want to take the opportunity to thank the president of this party, yes. Yes. Dr. Ronnie Irwood, for joining the ranks of this organization. Yes. I'm not saying, I'm not going to say you've seen the light. I think you've seen it a long time. Before. <laughs> and I want to also give some credit here to our general secretary, Mr. Steve yes. Black. Yes. And his team. Yes. His band of soldiers. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to thank you for your presence tonight and for listening to Mr. Trevor Yearwood, Java Marshall. And I, 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 I'm, I'm very, I feel that like independence does something to me. It gives me a spirit. It gives me a spirit because I've done there, I've been there, I've done that. And thank you very much for coming out tonight. God bless you all. <laughs>